if you're really interested in thorough house cleaning and not a superficial one, just to impress others, you will say, Lord, I want a real revelation on everything in my life that is unchristlike. In other words, is there anything in my life that I'm doing which I cannot do in fellowship with Jesus Christ? Everything in my life I must do in fellowship with Jesus Christ. And something I can't do in fellowship with Christ, I must not do. I've told people, if you're sitting watching television and something comes up which Jesus Christ will not sit next to you and watch and you keep watching it, I would even be bold enough to say, your Christianity is shallow. You've never really repented. Your conversion, your repentance was 90 degrees perhaps or zero. Certainly not 180 degrees. If it is 180 degree repentance, you would not sit and watch that television program where Jesus cannot sit and watch next, sitting next to you. You would not do anything. If you're signing a document and there's something fishy about that document, it's not absolutely accurate, maybe a financial statement. And Jesus cannot sign that as a witness. I, will, I wouldn't sign it. I remember a brother in our church once came to me. He said, Brother Zach, can you sign as a witness for this? I said, I can't because I feel this is not absolutely right. You can get offended with me, you like. I said, I will not sign as a witness. Because it's wrong what you're signing. You're cheating. So if you follow this principle, you'll be amazed to see the tremendous progress you make in your Christian life even within one year. It'll be constant progress. The revelation you get in scripture year after year after year. The progress you make. The understanding of God. Laying hold of eternal life. Knowing God more and more and experiencing his life more and more in you. So here is walking the way. This is how I know that I've not just come through the gate. But it's just, not just one side of my body being built up. The other side as well. I'm progressing. People have asked me this. Brother Zach, how do you know God's blessing you? And I say by the fact that he shows me unchristlikeness in my life regularly. That's how I know. It's not that, oh, so many people came to hear me or somebody said he was blessed. Well, praise God for all that. But that is not to me the mark of the greatest blessing. And that's God's mercy. And I know one thing. That God can use me even if I slip up and fail somewhere. You know, some people ask me, uh, is it right for a woman to be a preacher? A teacher of God's word? I say, according to scripture, no. 1 Timothy 2 is very clear. A woman should not teach men. It's an absolute statement. She can share her testimony or share what God has done in her life. But to teach is wrong. And they, they say, what about these, uh, some famous women preachers on television who they speak such good things and people are being blessed. I say, I agree. I'm not saying people are not being blessed. Let me tell you an Old Testament story. You read it in Numbers in chapter 20, 21. God told Moses to speak to the rock. The first time in Exodus 17, when they began their journey, God said, hit the rock and the waters flowed. Now, 40 years later, God says, you don't have to hit the rock now. Hitting the rock is a picture of Christ being crucified. And he doesn't have to be crucified a second time. I mean, Moses didn't understand that, but that was a symbolism. You don't hit the rock a second time. You don't crucify Christ again. Speak to the rock. Now, even if Moses didn't understand the symbolism of it, he should have obeyed God. But he was so angry with the Israelites, he took his rod and used rebels, he said, and he hit the rock. Now, my question is, when you disobey God, will there be a blessing? Did the waters flow or not? Does God bless a disobedient servant? Amazingly, yes. Why? Because he loved those two million thirsty people. Why should those two million people die of thirst just because one servant was disobedient? So that was not a proof that God was happy with Moses. It is a proof that God loved two million thirsty people. So when God blesses a woman's ministry or a man's ministry, it does not mean that God approves of that woman's teaching. It proves that God loves those needy people sitting there. That even when somebody is disobeying my word, I'll still bless those people. But then he will deal with that servant later on. 
Sure. He'll deal with every woman who disobeys God's word. And he'll deal with a man who disobeys God's word as well. He hauled up Moses after the water had flowed and everybody was blessed. Okay, Moses, now it's time for me to deal with you. How shall I deal with you? For disobeying my word. You have longed for 40 years to enter the land of Canaan, right? You are punished. You will not enter the land of Canaan. Wow. I mean, he would have gladly chosen leprosy or cancer instead of that. That was the severest punishment he could get. For what? For one simple thing. That he disobeyed the word of God. It was a small thing. It's a small thing when it says a woman shouldn't teach men. It's a small thing when God says, don't hit the rock, speak to it. The question is not whether it's a small thing or not. The question is, who said it? The person who said it was Almighty God. And that's what makes the difference. So, that's just in passing, I want to say, that the fact that God blesses our ministry is not the proof that God is happy with us. Please remember that all your life. I learned that long ago. The proof that God is blessing me is that I'm getting light on the unchristlike areas in my life every day. And God is my witness when I say this. I live in repentance every single day of my life. I'm discovering areas of unchristlikeness. I want to become totally like Jesus one day. And I want to make progress in that. And I know that my self-life is like a huge onion. I peel off one layer and I think I've come to the end of my self-life. No. Tomorrow something else happens and I discover another layer. Wow. I thought I'd finished with that. No, you haven't. Now, if you're not serious, you will never discover that second layer. You may tear off two or three layers of your self-life and you say, I made some progress because you're better than most of the other believers you know. That's the biggest problem with comparing yourself with others. If you want this all progress to stop in your life, just compare yourself with other believers in your church. I guarantee your progress will stop. And you will be proud. You'll get no more light on yourself. But if you really want to make progress and you want to go along the way, make a decision in your life that you'll only compare yourself with Jesus Christ. You'll run the race looking unto Jesus. Not looking here and there like Peter when he was walking on the water. He sank. You will sink too if you look here and there. Look only unto Jesus. And I guarantee you will always discover some area in your life that is unchristlike, And you repent of it. You may slip up again tomorrow. I'm, I know in my life I've slipped up in the same area sometimes many, many times. But I hate it. I confess it. I renounce it. And a day comes when that giant is under my feet. Maybe some giants can be killed with one blow. But some of these stronger giants need many blows before they are killed. But I'm determined to kill them. And you know how the, the Lord said, don't even spare the little children of those giants. And sometimes we spare those little children. Those teeny weeny things which we think are not so serious. Teeny weeny acts of selfishness. Words that are spoken in a subtle way to hurt somebody. The little giants, they don't look ugly like angry words. Do you ever use subtleties to hurt others? Those are the little children of the giants that need to be killed. And if you are serious about it, the giant and its family will be killed. And you'd have possessed a little more of the land of Canaan. So this is how progress is in the Christian life. There's a balance.